Dear people watching and listening, kindly subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification. Kindly say the durood to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayt ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidum majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama barik ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidum majid. Start of part 3. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the greatest start of chapter 1 everybody's choice wa innaka la'ala khuluqin azim and most certainly thou o muhammad art of most sublime and exalted character the noble quran surah kalam chapter 68 verse 4 how the topic arose. About 10 years ago, a distant cousin of mine, Mr. Muhammad Mahatar Faruqi, gave me a typed quotation by the French historian Lamartine. The quotation purported to prove that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet of Islam, was the greatest man that ever lived. Mr. Mahatar was in the habit of passing information on to me believing that I might put the same to some good use at the proper time and place. Before this, he had presented me with the call of the minaret, an expensive book written by Bishop Kenneth Cragg. By analyzing this book, I discovered the masterful deceit of the Christian Orientalists. Le Martin's tribute to our Prophet inspired me, and I had a great desire to share his thoughts about our Nabi with my Muslim brethren. The opportunity to do so was not long in coming. I received a phone call from the Muslim community in Danhauser, a small town in northern Natal, who were organizing a birthday celebration of the Holy Prophet. They invited me to give a lecture on that auspicious occasion, so I deemed it an honor and a privilege. I readily agreed. When they inquired, in view of their advertising needs, as to the subject of my lecture, I suggested on the inspiration from Lamartine, Muhammad the Greatest, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Repeated Letdowns On my arrival in Danhauser, I noticed a lot of posters advertising the meeting, which in essence said that Didat would be lecturing on the subject Muhammad the Great. I was somewhat disheartened and on inquiring was told, that the change in the title was due to a printer's error. Some two months later, I got another similar invitation, this time from the Muslim community of Pretoria, the administrative capital of South Africa. The subject I had mooted was the same, Muhammad, the greatest, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To my dismay, the topic was again changed to Muhammad, the great. Identical reasons and excuses were given. Both these incidents happened in South Africa, my own country. But let me give you one more example of our inferiority complex, so much part of the sickness of the Ummah. USA no different. On my lecture tour of the mighty United States in 1977, I discovered that our soldiers in the New World also had feet of clay. Out of the many sad experiences I have had, I think that this one will suffice to prove the point. The Muslims of Indianapolis were advised to organize a lecture for me on the subject, what the Bible says about Muhammad. They agreed to advertise just that, but their timidity did not permit them to do so. They thought the topic was too provocative, so they in their wisdom toned it down to a prophet in the Bible, a lifeless Insipid title, you will no doubt agree. Which Hindu, Muslim, Christian or Jew would be intrigued to attend? What does a prophet mean? To most, a prophet means any prophet. And who would be interested in attending a meeting where just any prophet in the Bible was debated? 
Job, Joel, Jonah, Ezra, Elisha, Ezekiel are just a few of the many mentioned in the Bible. As was to be expected, the attendance left much to be desired. Inferiority Complex What is the cause of this sickness? This inferiority complex? Yes, we are an emasculated people. Dynamism has been wrung out of us, not only by our enemies but by our own spiritless friends. We even dare not repeat Allah's own testimony regarding his beloved. And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, art of most sublime and exalted character. The Noble Qur'an, chapter 68, verse 4. The most influential. Normally, it is quite natural for anyone to love, praise, idolize or hero worship one's leader, be it a guru, saint or prophet, and very often we do. However, if I were to reproduce here what great Muslims have said or written about our illustrious prophet, it could be played down as exaggeration, fancy or idolization by the skeptics and the opponents of Islam. Therefore, allow me to quote unbiased historians, friendly critiques, and even avowed enemies of that mighty messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If the tributes of the non-Muslims do not touch your hearts, then you are in the wrong faith. Opt out of Islam. There is already too much dead wood on the ship of Islam. In recent times, a book has been published in America titled The Hundred, or the top 100, or the greatest hundred in history. A certain Michael H. Hart, described as a historian, mathematician and astronomer, has written this novel book. He has searched history, seeking for men who had the greatest influence on mankind. In this book, he gives us the hundred most influential men, including Ashoka, Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius, Hitler, Plato, and Zoroaster. He does not give us a mere chart of the topmost 100 from the point of view of their influence on people, but he evaluates the degree of their influence and rates them in order of their excellence from number 1 through to number 100. He gives us his reasons for the placing of his candidates. We are not asked to agree with him, but we cannot help admire the man's research and honesty. The most amazing thing about his election is that he has put our Nabi Kareem, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as number one, the first of his hundred, thus confirming unknowingly God's own testimony in his final revelation to the world. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Most certainly, you have in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern of behavior. The Noble Qur'an Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 21. Jesus, peace be upon him, number three. Heart placing the Prophet of Islam as number one has naturally pleased the Muslims, but his choice has shocked the non-Muslims, more especially the Jews and the Christians, who consider this as an affront. What? Jesus, peace be upon him, number three, and Moses, peace be upon him, number forty. This is for them very difficult to stomach. But what says heart? Let us hear his arguments. Since there are roughly twice as many Christians in the world, it may initially seem strange that Muhammad has been ranked higher than Jesus. There are two principal reasons for that decision. First, Muhammad played a far more important role in the development of Islam than Jesus did in the development of Christianity. Although Jesus was responsible for the main ethical and moral precepts of Christianity, insofar as these differed from Judaism, St. Paul was the main developer of Christian theology, its principal proselytizer, and the author of a large portion of the New Testament. Muhammad, however, was responsible for both the theology of Islam and its main ethical and moral principles. In addition, he played the key role in proselytizing the new faith and in establishing the religious practices of Islam. Michael H. Hart in his book, The Hundred, pages 38 and 39. Paul, the founder of Christianity. 
According to Hajj, the honor for founding Christianity is to be shared between Jesus salam, and St. Paul, the latter he believes to be the real founder of Christianity. I cannot help agreeing with Hart. Out of the total of 27 books of the New Testament, more than half is authored by Paul. As opposed to Paul, the Master has not written a single word of the 27 books. If you can lay your hands on what is called a red-letter Bible, you will find every word alleged to have been uttered by Jesus salam, in red ink and the rest in normal black ink. Don't be shocked to find that in this so-called Injil, the Gospel of Jesus, over 90% of the 27 books of the New Testament is printed in black ink. This is the candid Christian confession on what they call the Injil. In actual confrontation with Christian missionaries, you will find them quoting 100% from Paul. No one follows Jesus a.s. Jesus a.s. said, If you love me, keep my commandments. The Holy Bible, John chapter 14, verse 15. He said further, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Every Christian controversialist you question, do you keep the laws and the commandments, will answer, no. If you ask further, why don't you? He will, if he is a Bible thumper, invariably reply, the law is nailed to the cross, meaning the law is done away with. We are now living under grace. Every time you prod him with what his Lord and Master Jesus had said, he will confront you with something from Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, etc. If you ask, who are they? You will hear, Paul, Paul, Paul. Who is your master? You question, and he will say, Jesus. But he will ever and anon contradict his own Jesus by his Paul. No learned Christian will ever dispute the fact that the real founder of Christian is St. Paul. Therefore, Michael H. Hart, to be fair, had to place Jesus in slot number three. Why provoke your customer? This placing of Christ in the number three spot by Michael H. Hart poses a very serious question for us. Why would an American publish a book of 572 pages in America and selling in America for $15 each go out of his way to provoke his potential readers? Who will buy his books? Surely not the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis, neither the Arabs nor the Turks. Except for a few copies here and there, the overwhelming number of his customers will be from the 250 million Christians and the 6 million Jews of America. Then why did he provoke his customers? Did he not hear the dictum, the customer is always right? Of course he did. Then why his daring choice? But before I close this episode of Heart, I will allow him to make his one last apology for his temerity. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular level. Michael H. Hart Who were history's great leaders? Time, July 15, 1974 The world-famous Time carried the above rubric on its front cover. Inside the magazine were numerous essays as to what makes a great leader. Throughout history, who qualifies? Time asked a variety of historians, writers, military men, businessmen and others for their selections. Each gave his candidate according to his light, as objectively as is humanly possible, depending on one's own awareness and prejudice. Who knows Dr. Salazar? It is my habit and pleasurable duty to take non-Muslims on a guided tour of the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, the Juma Masjid, Durban. On one occasion, I was hosting a Portuguese couple, a husband and wife team. At some stage during the discussion, the Portuguese gentleman said that Dr. Salazar was the greatest man in the world. I did not debate the point with him, as I personally knew little about Dr. Salazar 
except that he was a one-time dictator of Portugal, all by too many a great benefactor to his nation. My poor visitor was, however, speaking according to his own knowledge, point of view, and prejudice. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cannot be ignored. Among the contributors to the time, it seems that none could ignore Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. William McNeil, a United States historian of the University of Chicago records, if you measure leadership by impact, then you would have to name Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, the great prophets of the world. McNeil does not go into details, nor does he give us any explanation as to why he placed Jesus first and Muhammad number three. Perhaps it was by force of habit. It is very likely that McNeil is a Christian. However, we will not argue with him. Then comes James Gavin, described as a United States Army man, a retired lieutenant general. He says, Among leaders who have made the greatest impact through ages, I would consider Muhammad, Jesus Christ, maybe Lenin, possibly Mao. As for a leader whose qualities we could most use now, I would choose John F. Kennedy. The general does not say much more, yet we have to salute him. It calls for tremendous fortitude to pen the name Muhammad before that of Christ. It surely was no slip of the pen. Jules Masserman, United States psychoanalyst and professor of the Chicago University, gives us, unlike the other contributors, the basis for making his selection. He gives us his reason for choosing his greatest leader of all times. He wants us to find out what we are really looking for in the man, the qualities that sets him apart. We may be looking for any sets of qualities, as in the case of Michael H. Hart, he was looking for a person wielding the most influential. However, Messerman does not want us to depend on our fancies or prejudices. He wants to establish objective standards for judging before we confer greatness upon anybody. He says that leaders must fulfill three functions. Number one, the leader must provide for the well-being of the lead. The leader, whoever he is, must be interested in your welfare. He must not be looking for milking cows for his own greed, like the Reverend Jim Jones of Jonestown, Guyana, of the suicide cult notoriety. You will remember him as the man who committed suicide together with 910 of his followers, all at the same time, en masse. The United States government was on his trail and he was on the verge of being caught for certain felonies. But before they could apprehend him, he thought it was wise to eliminate himself together with all his followers so that no one would be left to testify against him. He laced lemonade with cyanide and inspired his devotees to drink it. And so they did and they all died in disgrace. In the meantime, it was discovered that the Reverend Jim Jones had salted away $15 million and stacked it in his own account in banks throughout the world. All his victims were his milking cows and he was exploiting them to satisfy his own lust and greed. Masserman's hero must be found to benefit his sheep his flock and not himself. Number two, the leader or would-be leader must provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. Unlike the Marxist, the fascist, the Nazi, the neo-Nazi, the Ashkenazi, the Zionist and their fellow travelers, Professor Masserman in his brief essay in the Time magazine did not spell this out, but his beliefs and feelings are abundantly clear. He is in search of a leader who will provide a social order free of selfishness and greed and racism, for all these isms carry within them the seeds of their own destruction. There is still with us much sorrow and sin, injustice, oppression, wrong and hate. Still does arrogance deaden conscience, rob struggling souls of even the crumbs of pity, and make of loathsome flesh and crumbling dust fair-seeming idols for worship. Still does ignorance blow a mighty horn and try to shame true wisdom. Still do men drive slaves, protesting smoothly the end of slavery. 
Still does greed devour the substance of helpless ones within her power. Nay, more, the fine individual voice is smothered in the rocuous din of groups and crowds that madly shout what they call slogans new, old falsehoods long discredited. Abdullah Yusuf Ali Number 3. That this leader must provide his people with one set of beliefs. It is easy to talk of the fellowship of faith and the brotherhood of man, but in South Africa today, there are a thousand different sects and denominations among the whites, people of European descent, and three thousand among the blacks of African descent. The white churches in my country are spawning black bishops, fast, but in the first three hundred years of European conquest, they did not produce a single black bishop. Even now, the black, the white, the colored, and the Indian cannot pray together in most of the Dutch Reformed churches. The hatred between the Christian sects was aptly described by the Christian Emperor Julian, who said, No wild beasts are so hostile to man as Christian sects in general are to one another. Sayyid Amir Ali in his Spirit of Islam With the foregoing three standards, Massaman searches history and analyzes Louis Pasteur, Salk, Gandhi, Confucius, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Hitler, Buddha, Jesus and the rest, finally coming to the conclusion that perhaps the greatest leader of all times was Muhammad, who combined all three functions, and to a lesser degree, Moses did the same. We cannot help marveling at Masserman, that as a Jew he condescends to scrutinize even Adolf Hitler, the arch enemy of his people. He considers Hitler to be a great leader. His race, the mighty German nation of 19 million people, was ready to march to destiny or destruction at his behest, as as he led them to ruin. Hitler is not the question. The question is why would Messerman, as an American Jew, a paid servant of the government, proclaim to his countrymen of over 200 million Jews and Christians that not Jesus, not Moses, but Muhammad was the greatest leader of all times? Account for that. Michael H. Hart put Muhammad number one on his list and his own Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ number three. Why? Was he bribed? William McNeil considers Muhammad as worthy of honor in his list of the first three names of his. Why? Was he bribed? James Gavin puts Muhammad before Christ. Why? Was he bribed? Jules Messerman adjudges Muhammad number one and his own hero Moses a close second. Why? Was he bribed? Are we to suppose that all the glowing adulation of Muhammad was a miserable piece of intellectual legerdemain, hocus pocus. I, for my part, cannot form any such supposition. One could be entirely at a loss what to think of mankind at all if quackery so grew and flourished in the world. Yet the scoffers bemoan anyone who has nothing good to say about Muhammad or Islam as having been bribed by the Arabs. They are giving too much credit to my brethren, I repeat. It is possible but it is improbable. During the Second World War, Norway produced only one Quisling. He was tried for treason and executed. It is unlikely that America and the Western world have just reached puberty to spawn a breed of Quislings nurtured by not petrodollars from the Middle East. Please do not demean your honest, courageous men, who without fear or favor are prepared to suffer obloquy for their convictions. We must all admire them. We can now justifiably conclude that the God of mercy, who forever recognizes the sincere efforts of his servants, is only fulfilling his promise to Muhammad, his chosen messenger. وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou art held? The Noble Qur'an, Surah Inshirah, Chapter 94, Verse 4 Alternative renderings A. Have we not exalted thy fame? B. And have we not raised thy name for thee? C. Have we not given you high renown? Friends and foe alike, as if by some secret compulsion are made to pay unsolicited tributes to this mighty messenger of God. 
but the Almighty enlists even the devil into his service, as he had done in the time of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 11. Even the devil sometimes speaks gospel truths. Professor K. S. Ramakrishna Rao, a Hindu philosopher in his book Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, quotes the arch devil himself. Yes, Adolf Hitler to prove the unique greatness of Muhammad. The professor, like Jules Masserman, who had evaluated the Prophet of Islam on three grounds, also saw Hitler's Mien Kampf, a three faceted jewel, a rare commodity which he found in our hero under discussion. Quoting Hitler, he says, A great theorist is seldom a great leader. An agitator is far more likely to possess these qualities. He will always be a better leader, for leadership means the ability to move masses of men. The talent to produce ideas has nothing in common with the capacity for leadership. Hitler continues, The union of the theorist, organizer and leader in one man is the rarest phenomenon on this earth. Therein consists greatness. Professor Rao concludes in his own words, in the person of the Prophet of Islam, the world has seen the rarest phenomenon on earth, walking in flesh and blood. Share the anger. Before anyone assails the professor of undue bias and bribery, let me give them a few more names of admirers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1. Muhammad was the soul of kindness and his influence was felt and never forgotten by those around him. A Hindu scholar, Diwan Chand Sharma, in his The Prophets of the East, Calcutta, 1935, page 122. 2. Four years after the death of Justinian, A.D. 569, was born at Mecca in Arabia the man who, of all men, exercised the greatest influence upon the human race, Muhammad. John William Draper, M.D., L.L.D., in his a History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, London, 1875. 3. I doubt whether any man whose external conditions changed so much ever changed himself less to meet them. R.V.C. Bodley in The Messenger, London, 1946, page 9. 4. I have studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the saviour of humanity. George Bernard Shaw in The Genuine Islam, Volume 1, Number 81936. 5. By a fortune absolutely unique in history, Muhammad is a threefold founder of a nation, of an empire, and of a religion. R. Bosworth Smith in Muhammad and Muhammadanism, 1946. 6. Muhammad was the most successful of all religious personalities. Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition. Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu Alaikum. Kindly like, share and subscribe to my channel. And kindly send durood to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama barikta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid Start of chapter 2 from the historical past. It is not difficult to reproduce a further dozen or more eulogies by the admirers and critics of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Despite all their objectivity, jaundiced minds can always conjure up some aspersions. Let me take my readers deep down in past history. It was Friday the 8th of May 1840, that is about 150 years ago, at a time when it was a sacrilege to say anything good about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Christian West was trained to hate the man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his religion. 
the same way as dogs were at one stage trained in my country to hate all black people. At that time in history, Thomas Carlyle, one, one of, of the, the greatest thinkers of the past century, delivered a series of lectures under the theme Heroes and Hero Worship. Developed Sickness Carlyle exposed this blind prejudice of his people at the beginning of his talk. He made reference to one of the literary giants, a Dutch scholar and statesman by the name of Hugo Grotius, who had written a bitter and abusive invective against the Prophet of Islam. He had falsely charged that the Holy Prophet had trained pigeons to pick out peas from his ears, so that he could by his trick bluff his people that the Holy Ghost in the shape of a dove was revealing God's revelation to him, which he then had them recorded in his Bible, the Quran. Perhaps Grotius was inspired into this fairy tale from his reading of his own holy scriptures. Then Jesus, when he had been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. The Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Where's the authority? Pocock, another respected intellectual of the time, like Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 25, wanted proof about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pigeons and the peas. Grotius answered that there was no proof. He just felt like inventing this story for his audience. To him and his audience, the pigeons and peas theory was more plausible than that of the archangel dictating to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These falsities wrung the heart of Carlyle. He cried, The lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped round this man are disgraceful to ourselves only. Thomas Carlyle The Hero Prophet Carlyle was a man of genius and God gifted him with the art of articulation. In his own way, he wanted to put the record straight. He planned to deliver a lecture and he chose a very provocative topic, the hero as prophet, and he chose his hero prophet to be the most malign man of his time, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not Moses, David, Solomon or Jesus, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To placate his overwhelming Anglican belonging to the Church of England, fellow countrymen, he apologized. As there is no danger of our becoming any of us Mahometans, I mean to say all the good of him I justly can. In other words, he as well as his elite audience were free from the fear of converting to Islam and could take a chance in paying some compliments to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he had any fear regarding the strength of their faith, he would not have taken that chance. In an era of hatred and spite towards everything Islamic and to an audience full of skepticism and cynicism, Carlyle unfolded many a glowing truth about his hero, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the praiseworthy, indeed be praised, for that is what the very name Muhammad means, the praised one, the praiseworthy. There are times when Carlyle uses words and expressions which might not be too pleasing to the believing Muslim, but one has to forgive him as he was walking a cultural tightrope and he succeeded eminently. He paid our hero many ardent and enthusiastic tributes and defended him from the false charges and calumnies of his enemies, exactly as the Prophet had done in the case of Jesus salam and his mother salam. His Sincerity 1a. The great man's sincerity is of the kind he cannot speak of. Nay, I suppose, he is conscious rather of insincerity. For what man can walk accurately by the law or truth for one day? No, the great man does not boast himself sincere. Far from that, perhaps does not ask himself if he is so. I would say rather, his sincerity does not depend on himself. He cannot help being sincere. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 59 B. A silent, great soul. He was one of those who cannot be in earnest, whom nature herself has appointed to be sincere, 
while others walk in formulas and hearsays, contented enough to dwell there, this man could not screen himself in formulas. He was alone with his own soul and the reality of things. Such sincerity as we named it has in very truth something of divine. The word of such a man is a voice direct from nature's own heart. Men do and must listen to that as to nothing else. All else is wind in comparison. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 71 In his lengthy speech, Carlyle did not have the opportunity to inform his audience about the sources of his inferences. I may furnish just one incident from the life of the Prophet, an incident which reflects the highest degree of his sincerity in recording a revelation in the Holy Quran, even if it seems to reprove him for some natural and human zeal. Admonition as Revealed It was in the early days of his mission in Mecca, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was deeply engrossed in trying to invite the leaders of the pagan Quraysh to his teachings. Apparently, one of them was giving him an attentive hearing when a poor blind man by the name of Abdullah ibn Umi Maktoum tried to barge in into the discussion and wanted to draw attention to himself. The Blessed Prophet wasallam said nothing, but a thought went through his mind. Why don't you have a little patience? Can't you see sense that because of your impatience, I might lose these customers? I believe that lesser men, sinners and saints will not be questioned for such lapses, but not so for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did not God choose him and honor him with that lofty status as recorded? And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, art of most sublime and exalted character. The Noble Quran, Surah Kalam, Chapter 68, Verse 4 He frowned. Whilst in the midst of the conversation with his pagan fellow tribesmen, God Almighty sends Gabriel, the angel of revelation, with this admonition. The Prophet frowned and turned away. Because there came to him the blind man interrupting. But what could tell thee? that perchance he might grow in spiritual understanding? Or that he might receive admonition and the teaching might profit him? The Noble Qur'an Surah Abasa Chapter 80 Verses 1-4 to The Holy Prophet wasallam, had naturally disliked the interruption. Perhaps the poor man's feelings were hurt, but he whose gentle heart ever sympathized with the poor and the afflicted got new light revelation from his Lord, and without the least hesitation, he immediately published it for all eternity. Subsequently, every time he met this blind man, he received him graciously and thanked him that on his account the Lord had remembered him during Muhammad's absences from Medina. The blind man was made the governor of the city twice. Such was the sincerity and gratitude of Carlyle's hero prophet. His Fidelity 2. It is a boundless favor. He never forgot this good Khadija. Long afterwards, Aisha, his young favorite wife, a woman who indeed distinguished herself among the Muslims by all manners of qualities, through her whole long life, this young brilliant Aisha was one day questioning him. Now am not I better than Khadija? She was a widow, old, and had lost her looks. You love me better than you did her? No, by Allah, answered Muhammad. No, by Allah. She believed in me when none else would believe. In the whole world, I had but one friend, and she was that. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 76 it would have been easier to repel the temptation of the devil than to succumb to the ego of a young, loving, brilliant and beautiful wife like Lady Aisha Siddiqa radiyallahu ta'ala anha. Why not let her hear the soft, soothing balm of flattery? It will not harm anyone. Even the soul of Bibi Khatija, the mother of the faithful, would look light-heartedly at the ruse. 
There is no shaming, no innocent white lies with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Traits of this kind show us the genuine man, brother of us all, brought visible through 14 centuries, the veritable son of our common mother. Al-Amin, the faithful. 3a. A man of truth and fidelity, true in what he did, in what he spake and thought. They noted that he always meant something, a man rather taciturn in speech, silent when there was nothing to be said, but pertinent, wise, sincere when he did speak, always throwing light on the matter. This is the only sort of speech worth speaking. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 69. B. Muhammad naturally gave offense to the Quraysh, keepers of the Kaaba, superintendents of the idols. One or two men of influence had joined him. The thing spread slowly, but it was spreading. Naturally, he gave offense to everybody. The Jews hated the Prophet. The Christians hated the Prophet. The Mushriks, the polytheists hated the Prophet. And the Munafikin, the hypocrites, hated the Prophet. It is the nature of falsehood to hate the truth. Light eliminates darkness, but darkness does not take kindly to light. C. Not a mealy-mouthed man. A candid ferocity, if the case call for it, is in him. He does not mince matters. The war of Tubak is a thing he often speaks of. His men refused, many of them, to march on that occasion. Pleaded the heat of the weather, the harvest, and so forth. He can never forget that. Your harvest? It lasts for a day. What will become of your harvest through all eternity? Hot weather? Yes, it was hot, but hell will be hotter. Sometimes a rough sarcasm turns up. He says to the unbelievers, Ye shall not have short weight. Heroes and Hero Worship, pages 95 and 96. Remember, Thomas Carlyle uttered these words and many more to a shocked and bewildered Christian audience in England a hundred and fifty years ago. History did not record for us the lively arguments and debates which his lecture must naturally have caused. He kept to his promise. I mean to say all the good of him, I justly can. And he went on in his talk to defend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam against the false charges, slander and calumnies of his enemies. Charge of Falsity 4a. A false man found a religion? Why? A false man cannot build a brick house. If he does not know and follow truly the properties of mortar, burnt clay and what else he works in, it is no house that he makes, but a rubbish heap. It will not stand for twelve centuries to lodge a hundred and eighty millions. It will fall straight away. Speciosities are spacious. It is like a forged bank note. They get it passed out of their worthless hands. Others, not they, have to smart for it. Nature bursts up in fire flames, French revolutions and such like, proclaiming with the terrible veracity that forged notes are forged. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 58. B. It goes greatly against the imposter theory, the fact that he lived in this entirely unexceptionable, entirely quiet and commonplace way till the heat of his years was done. He was forty before he talked of any mission from heaven. All his ambition, seemingly, had been hitherto to live an honest life. His fame, the mere good opinion of neighbors that knew him. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 70. C. Ambition? What could all Arabia do for this man? With the crown of Greek Heraclius, of Persian Khosrows, and all the crowns in earth, what could they all do for him? It was not of the heaven above and of the hell beneath, all crowns and sovereignties whatsoever. Where would they in a few brief years be? To be sheikh of Mecca or Arabia and have a bit of guilt wood put into your hand. Will that be one's salvation? I decidedly think not. We will leave it altogether, this imposter hypothesis, as not creditable, not very tolerable even, worthy chiefly of dismissal by us. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 72 and 73.
charge of sinning. 5. Faults, the greatest of faults I should say, is to be conscious of none. Readers of the Bible above all, one would think might know better. Who is called there the man according to God's own heart? David, the Hebrew king, had fallen into sins enough, blackest crimes. There was no want of sins. And thereupon the unbelievers sneer and ask, Is this your man according to God's heart? The sneer, I must say, seems to me but a shallow one. What are faults? What are the outward details of a life? If the inner secret of it, the remorse, temptations, true, often baffled, never-ended struggle of it be forgotten? It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Of all acts, is not for a man repentance the most divine? The deadliest sin, I say, was the same supercilious consciousness of no sin. That is death, the heart so conscious is divorced from sincerity, humility, and fact, is dead. It is pure as dead dry sand is pure. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 61 Charge of the Sword The greatest crime, the greatest sin of Muhammad wasallam in the eyes of the Christian West is that he did not allow himself to be slaughtered, to be crucified by his enemies. He ably defended himself, his family and his followers and finally vanquished his enemies. Muhammad wasallam's success is the Christian gall of disappointment he did not believe in any vicarious sacrifice for the sins of others. He believed and behaved naturally. In the state of nature, everyone has a right to defend his person and possessions and extend his hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation, says Gibbon, the master historian in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. His struggle and victory over the forces of unbelief and evil made the editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica to exclaim Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be the most successful of all religious personalities. How can the enemies of Islam account for Muhammad's phenomenal achievements except to decry that he spread his religion at the point of the sword? He forced Islam down people's throats? 6a History makes it clear, however, that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world and forcing Islam at the point of the sword upon conquered races is one of the most fantastically absurd myths that historians have ever repeated. De Lacey O'Leary in Islam at the Crossroads, London, 1923, page 8. You do not have to be a historian like O'Leary to know that the Muslims ruled Spain for 736 years. The longest the Christians ever ruled over Muslims was 500 years in Mozambique, a territory captured from an Arab governor by the name of Musa bin Baik, a name they could not properly pronounce, hence the name Mozambique. Even today, after five centuries of Christian overlordship, the country is still 60% Muslim. However, after eight centuries in Spain, the Muslims were totally eliminated from that country so that not even one man was left to give the azan, the Muslim call to prayer. If the Muslim had used force, military or economic, there would not have been any Christians left in Spain to have kicked the Muslims out. One can blame the Muslims for exploitation, if you like, but one cannot charge them with using the sword to convert Spaniards to the Islamic religion. Today, Islam is still spreading all over the world and Muslims have no sword. The Muslims were also the masters of India for a thousand years, but eventually when the subcontinent received independence in 1947, the Hindus obtained three quarters of the country and the Muslims the balance of the one quarter. Why? Because the Muslims did not force Islam down the Hindus' throat. In Spain and in India, the Muslims were no paragons of virtue, yet they obeyed the Quranic injunction to the letter. La ikraha fitteen. Let there be no compulsion in religion. For truth stands out distinct from error. The Noble Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 256. The Muslim conquerors understood from this command 
that compulsion was incompatible with true religion because a religion depends on faith and will and these would be meaningless if induced by force force can conquer but cannot convert b truth and error have been so clearly shown up by the mercy of god that there should be no doubt in the minds of any person of good will as to the fundamentals of faith c god's protection is continuous and his plan is always to lead us from the depths of darkness into the clearest light except for some eccentrics here and there the muslims as a whole adhere to the commandment of god in the lands over which they held sway but what can the enemy say about countries where no single muslim soldier had set foot one indonesia it is a fact that over a hundred million indonesians are muslims yet no conquering muslim army ever landed on any of its over two thousand islands two malaysia the overwhelming number of its people in this country are muslims yet no muslim soldier had landed there either three africa the majority of the people on the east of Africa, as far down as Mozambique, as well as the bulk of the inhabitants on the west coast of the continent are Muslims. But history does not record any invading hordes of Muslims from anywhere. What sword? Where was the sword? The Muslim trader did the job. His good conduct and moral rectitude achieved the miracle of conversion. All what you say seems inconvertible, Mr. Didat says the Christian controversialist. But we are talking about Islam at its very beginning, the way in which your prophet converted the pagans to his faith. How did he do it if not with the sword? One against all. We can do no better than to allow Thomas Carlyle himself to defend his hero prophet against this false charge. Seven. The sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? Every new opinion at its starting is precisely in a minority of one. In one man's head alone there it dwells as yet. One man alone of the whole world believes it. There is one man against all men. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. You must first get your sword. On the whole a thing will propagate itself as it can. We do not find of the Christian religion either that it always disdained the sword when once it had got one. Charlemagne's conversion of the Saxons was not by preaching. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 80. At the age of 40, when Muhammad wasallam, declared his divine mission from heaven, there was no political party or royalty and certainly no family or tribe to back him up. His people, the Arabs, immersed in idol worship and fetishism, were not by any means a docile people. They were no easy meat. They were a subject to all kinds of fierce insincerities. One man single-handed to wean such a people from barbarism required nothing short of a miracle. A miracle did happen. God alone could have made Islam and Muhammad wasallam to triumph through with flimsy, gossamer support. God fulfilling his promise. And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou, O Muhammad, art held? The Noble Quran, Surah Inshirah, Chapter 94, Verse 4. Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu Alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Kindly send Durood to Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. Start of chapter three. Fastest growing religion today. The sword of the intellect. The enemy, the skeptic, the missionary, and their passive camp followers 
will not stop bleating that Islam was spread at the point of the sword. But they will not venture to answer our question, who bribed Carlyle? In 1840, when Carlyle defended Muhammad وسلم, and refuted the allegation about the sword, there was nobody around to bribe. The whole Muslim world was in the gutters. The countries of Islam were all under subjugation by the Christians, except for a few like Persia, Afghanistan and Turkey, who were only nominally independent. There were no riches to flaunt and no petrodollars to bribe with. That was yesterday and many yesterdays ago. But what about today in modern times? It is claimed from this chart that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. The overall increase of all the sects and denominations of Christianity was a staggering 138% with the incredible increase of Islam by 235% in the same period of time of half a century. It is further affirmed that in Britain and the United States of America, Islam is the fastest growing faith. It is said that in Britain, there are more Muslims than Methodists in the country. You have a right to ask, what sword? The answer is, the sword indeed, Thomas Carlyle. It is the sword of the intellect. It is the fulfillment of yet another prophecy. It is he, God Almighty, who has sent Messenger Muhammad وسلم, with guidance. Wadin al Haqqi and the religion of truth, Islam. That he may make it prevail over all religions. And enough is God for a witness. Holy Quran, Surah Fatih, Chapter 48, Verse 28 The destiny of Islam is spelt out here in the clearest terms. Islam is to master, overcome and supersede every other faith. That he, God Almighty, make it, Islam, prevail over all religions. In Arabic, the word deen, literally meaning way of life to supersede all, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Judaism, Communism or any other ism, this is the destiny of Allah's deen. The same Quranic verse is repeated in chapter 61, verse 9, which ends with this slight variation. Never mind though the unbelievers might be averse to it, Islam. Triumph of Islam Islam will prevail. It is the promise of God. And his promise is true. But how? With the sword? Not even if we had the laser gun. Could we use it? The Holy Quran forbids us to use force as a means of converting. Yet the verse prophecies that Islam would be the most dominant of all religions. The triumphs of its doctrines have already started and is gaining hold over the religious ideology and doctrines of the various schools of thought in the world. Though not in the name of Islam, but in the name of reformation and amendments, the doctrines of Islam are being fastly grafted into the various religious orders. Many things which are exclusively Islamic and which were formerly unknown or which were being opposed before with tooth and nail by the other creeds are now part of their beliefs. The brotherhood of man, the abolition of the caste system and untouchability, the right of women to inherit, opening the places of worship to all, prohibition of all intoxicants, the true concept of the unity of God, etc., etc. Just one word on the last subject above before we proceed further. Ask any theist, polytheist, pantheist or trinitarian how many gods he believes in. He will shudder to say anything other than one. This is the effect of the strict monotheism of Islam. The creed of Muhammad is free from the suspicions of ambiguity and the Quran is a glorious testimony to the unity of God. Given in his 
Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Verdict of Non-Muslim Orientals Almost all the defenders of Muhammad وسلم, who spoke out against the false theory that he spread his religion at the point of the sword were Westerners. Let us now hear what some non-Muslim Easterners have to say on this subject. 8a. The more I study, the more I discover that the strength of Islam does not lie in the sword. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of modern India in Young India. b. They, Muhammad's critics, see fire instead of light, ugliness instead of good. They distort and present every good quality as a great vice. It reflects their own depravity. The critics are blind. They cannot see that the only sword Muhammad wielded was the sword of mercy, compassion, friendship and forgiveness. The sword that conquers enemies and purifies their hearts, his sword was sharper than the sword of steel. Pandit Gyanandra Dev Sharma Shastri at a meeting in Gorakhpur, India, 1928. See, he preferred migration to fighting his own people. But when oppression went beyond the pale of tolerance, he took up his sword in self-defense. Those who believe religion can be spread by force are fools, who neither know the ways of religion nor the ways of the world. They are proud of this belief because they are a long, long way away from the truth. A Sikh journalist in Nawan, Hindustan, Delhi, 17 November 1947. It was Rudyard Kipling who said, East is East and West is West, never the twain shall meet. He was wrong. In the defense of Muhammad, all who are not blinded by prejudice will converge. Three other standards. Fourteen years after Thomas Carlyle had delivered his lecture on his hero prophet, a Frenchman by the name of Lamartine wrote the history of the Turks. Incidentally, the Turks being Muslims, Lamartine touched on some aspects of Islam and its founder, like our Jules Masserman of current times, who had conceived three objective standards for discovering greatness of leadership. Lamartine had over a century ago thought of three other objective standards for conferring greatness. We must give credit to the Westerner for this type of insight. Lamartine opines, 9. If greatness of purpose, smallness of means and astounding results are the three criteria of human genius, who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? Lamartine ends his lengthy segment of literary masterpiece with the words philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, the founder of twenty terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Lamartine, Histoire de la Turquie, Paris, 1854. The answer to his question, is there any man greater than he, is reposed in the question itself. By implication, he is saying, there is no man greater than Muhammad. Muhammad is the greater man that ever lived. And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou, O Muhammad, art held? Holy Quran, Surah Ishirah, Chapter 94, Verse 4 Most certainly thou hast, O my Lord. Before we absolve Lamartine of any favoritism, partiality, or of the charge of being bright, we will scrutinize his three standards and whether they can be justified in the case of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1. Greatness of Purpose History of the time will tell you that it was the darkest period in the history of mankind when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded to declare his mission. The need was for the raising of prophets in every corner of the world or the sending of one master messenger for the whole of mankind to deliver them from falsehood, superstition, selfishness, polytheism, 
wrong and oppression. It was to be the reclamation of the whole of humanity. And God Almighty in his wisdom chose his prophet from the backwaters of Arabia as his universal messenger. Thus he records in his noble book, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِذَا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we send thee not, O Muhammad, but as a mercy unto all the worlds. Holy Quran, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, Verse 107 There is no question now of race or nation, of a chosen people, or the seed of Abraham, or the seed of David, or of Hindu Arya Varta, of Jew or Gentile, Arab or Ajam Persian, Turk or Tajik, European or Asiatic, white or colored, Aryan, Semitic, Mongolian or African, or American, Australian or Polynesian. To all men and creatures who have any spiritual responsibility, the principles universally apply. Abdullah Yusuf Ali Jesus, peace be upon him, discriminates. Muhammad's immediate predecessor advised his disciples, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, meaning non-Jews. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, meaning non-Jews, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. The Gospel writers are unanimous in recording that Christ lived by the precepts which he preached. In his lifetime, he did not preach to a single non-Jew. In fact, he spurned a Gentile woman who sought his spiritual blessings. The woman was a Greek in Mark chapter 7 verse 26. Then during the Passover season in Jerusalem, when the master with his disciples had congregated for the occasion, certain Greeks hearing of his reputation sought an audience with him for spiritual enlightenment. But Jesus gave them the cold shoulder, as narrated by St. John, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came before to Philip and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Holy Bible, John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 22. Self-Glorification the verses that follow do not even record the courtesy of Ya yeah, Ya yeah, or Nay nee, Nay, nee, Yes Yes or No No of Matthew chapter 5 verse 37. They continue with his own praise. And Jesus answered them, Andrew and Philip, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man referring to himself should be glorified. Holy Bible, John chapter 12 verse 23 highest standards. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could never afford any such latitudes. Remember how the Almighty reminded him of the highest etiquette required from him. Even the thought of being ruffled by the untimely intrusion of a blind man was not accepted from him. As a universal messenger, God set for him the most lofty standards. And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, out of most sublime and exalted character. Holy Quran, Surah Kalam, Chapter 68, Verse 4 And his diocese, his field of mission, the whole of mankind. And we sent thee not, O Muhammad, but as a mercy unto all the worlds. Holy Quran, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, Verse 107 Universal Messenger These are not mere platitudes, beautiful sentiments bereft of action. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam practiced what he preached. Among his first sahabas, companions and converts, beside the Arab can be counted Bilal the Abyssinian, Salman the Persian and Abdullah bin Salam the Jew. The skeptics may say that his outreach was simply incidental. But what can they say about the historical fact that before his demise, he sent out five epistles, one to each of the five surrounding countries, inviting them to accept the religion of Islam. 1. The Emperor of Persia. 2. The King of Egypt. 
3. The Negus of Abyssinia. 4. The Emperor Heraclius at Constantinople. And 5. The King of Yemen. Thus he set the example for the fulfillment of his impelling mission, his greatness of purpose, the reclamation of the whole of humanity into the master's fold. Is there another example of such universality in any other religion? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not out to set or to break any records. He was simply carrying out the trust that was reposed in him by the Lord of creation. 2. Smallness of Means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born with no silver spoon in his mouth. His life begins with infinitesimal support. His father had died before he was born. His mother dies by the time he was six years old. He was doubly orphaned at this tender age. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, takes charge of the child, but within three years he also died. As soon as he was able, he began to look after his uncle Abu Talib's sheep and goats for his keep. Contrast this poor, doubly orphaned Arab child with some of the great religious personalities that preceded him. And you must marvel at what destiny had in store for him. Abraham, the spiritual father of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the son of a very successful businessman of his times. Moses was reared in the house of the Pharaoh. Jesus, though described as a carpenter and the son of a carpenter, was well endowed with learning as well as material means. Peter, Philip, Andrew, etc., all down tools and followed him to be at his beck and call, not because he had any halo on his head, there was no such thing, but because of his affluent attire and princely bearing. He could command mansions in Jerusalem for himself and his disciples even during the height of the festive season, and have sumptuous suppers arranged, and you could hear him reproach the materialistic Jews. And when they found him, Jesus, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were fulfilled. Holy Bible, John chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. Nothing to offer. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no bread nor meat to offer. No sugar plums of any kind in this world or the next. The only thing he could offer his bedraggled poor shepherd people was trial and tribulations and the straitjacketing of their lives here on earth and the good pleasures of God in the hereafter. The life of the Prophet was an open book before them. He had shown them as to what he was, the nobility of his character, his integrity of purpose, his earnestness and fiery enthusiasm for the truth he had come to preach revealed the hero, and they followed him. Mr. Stanley Lane Poole's estimate of our hero is so beautiful and yet so truthful that I cannot resist the temptation of quoting it here. He was an enthusiast in that noblest sense, when enthusiasm becomes the salt of the earth. The one thing that keeps men from rotting whilst they live. Enthusiasm is often used despitefully because it is joined to an unworthy cause or falls upon barren ground and bears no fruit. So was it not with Muhammad? He was an enthusiast when enthusiasm was the one thing needed to set the world aflame and his enthusiasm was noble for a noble cause. He was one of those happy few who have attained the supreme joy of making one great truth their very life spring. He was the messenger of the one God and never to his life's end did he forget who he was or the message which was the marrow of his being. He brought his tidings to his people with a grand dignity sprung from the consciousness of his high office, together with a most sweet humility whose roots lay in the knowledge of his own weakness. It may easily be conceded that Muhammad wasallam was blessed with the filmsiest of human resources. In fact, the odds were loaded against him. But what about his fortune towards the end of his earthly sojourn? He was the overlord of the whole of Arabia. What about the endless means at his disposal then? 
we will allow a Christian missionary to answer that. He was Caesar and Pope in one, but he was Pope without the Pope's pretensions, and Caesar without the legions of Caesar, without a standing army, without a bodyguard, without a palace, without a fixed revenue. If ever any man had the right to say that he ruled by the right divine, it was Muhammad, for he had all the powers without its instruments and without its supports. R. Bosworth Smith, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, London, 1874, page 92. His Handicaps His weakness was his strength. The very fact that he had no material means of support made him to put his entire trust in God, and God the Merciful did not forsake him. His success was all the more staggering. May not the Muslims justly say the entire work was the work of God? And Muhammad, his instrument? 3. Outstanding Results In the words of Thomas Carlyle, one man against all men, to a hundred and twenty-four thousand at the farewell pilgrimage alone. How many were left behind of men, women and children, believers all? On the twelfth of Rabi level, in the eleventh year after the Hijra, approximating to the eighth of June 632 of the Christian era, whilst praying earnestly in whisper, the spirit of the great Prophet took flight to the blessed companionship on high. Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu on receiving the sad news of the demise of the Holy Prophet wasallam, lost his bearings. He was so shocked that he blurted out, If anyone says that Muhammad is dead, I will chop off his head. Hazrat Abu Bakr Rasiddiq presently verified that the Master had indeed departed from this world, and coming out from the Prophet's apartment announced to the gathering throng outside, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had indeed passed away. Those that worshipped Muhammad, he said, let them know that Muhammad is dead. But those who worship Allah, let them know that Allah lives forever. This brought Umar al-Farooq anhu back to his senses. Could this man who was to become the second great Khalifa of Islam at this moment imagine that 1400 years later there would be a thousand million followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at one time? Could he have visualized that the religion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be the fastest growing religion in the world? Christianity had a 600 year start on Islam. Numerically, the Christians claim to outnumber the followers of any other faith. This is true, but let us look at the picture in its true perspective. There are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. But there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. R.V.C. Bodley, The American in The Messenger, The Life of Muhammad, USA, 1969. I understand that Mr. Bodley is trying to tell us that there are people in the world who, when filling their census forms, will take off the term Christian under religion. It is not necessarily that they believe in the dogmas of Christianity. They could actually be atheists or Bush Baptists, as opposed to being a Jew or Hindu or Muslim. Coming from a Christian background, they would for the purpose of convenience label themselves Christian. From that point of view and from the point of view that a person who practices what he believes, there would be more Muslims in the world than Christians. Chronologically, Islam is 600 years behind Christianity, but amazingly, it is a very close second and is catching up fast. The fastest growing religion in the world today, one billion, the figure is outstanding and the sincerity and practice of the believers astonishing. Taking into account his own three objective standards, a. Greatness of purpose, b. Smallness of means, and c. Outstanding results. Does Lamartine dare to produce any other candidate greater than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He further awes his readers with the multifarious roles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he excelled, that is, philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, the restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, 
the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and one of spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards, I repeat all, by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? No, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the greatest man that ever lived, according to Lamartine, the French historian, and God Almighty questions. And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou, O Muhammad, art held? Holy Quran, Surah Ishirah, chapter 94, verse 4. Most assuredly thou hast, O my Lord. The Quality of Mercy The Christian propagandists make the wild boast that there is nothing in the history of mankind to compare with the merciful and forgiving cry of Jesus salam on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Holy Bible, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Amazing as it may sound, of the folk writers of the canonical Gospels, only St. Luke was inspired by the Holy Ghost to pen these words. The other three, Matthew, Mark and John, never heard these words or they felt them to be too insipid or not important enough for recording. St. Luke was not even one of the twelve disciples selected by Jesus. According to the revisers of the Revised Standard Version, RSV of the Bible, these words are not in the most ancient manuscripts, which by implication means that they are an interpolation. In the New King James Version, copyrighted by the Thomas Nelson Publishers in 1984, we are told that these words are not in the original text of the Greek manuscripts of St. Luke. In other words, they have been fabricated by some pious gentleman. Although the quotation is unauthentic, we will still entertain it because it demonstrates great piety of loving one's enemies and of unsurpassed forgiveness as preached by the Master himself. For forgiveness to be of any worth, the forgiver must be in a position to forgive. If the victim of injustice is still in the clutches of his enemies, in that helpless position, and he would cry out, I forgive you, it would be meaningless. But if the aggrieved party had turned the tables on his enemies and was in a position of taking revenge or exact retribution, and yet say, I forgive you, only then would it mean something. Muhammad's Clemency Contrast the alleged forgiveness from the cross with the historical bloodless conquest of Mecca by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the head of 10,000 saints, his companions. The city which had treated him so cruelly, driven him and his faithful band for refuge among strangers, which had sworn his life and the lives of his devoted disciples, lay at his feet. His old persecutors, relentless and ruthless, who had disgraced humanity by inflicting cruel outrages upon inoffensive men and women, and even upon the lifeless dead, were now completely at his mercy. But in the hour of his triumph, every evil suffered was forgotten, every injury inflicted was forgiven, and a general amnesty was extended to the population of Mecca. Sayyid Amir Ali in The Spirit of Islam Calling before him the populace of the vanquished city, he addressed them with, What do you expect at my hands today? His people had known him too well, even from his childhood, so they replied, Mercy, O generous brother and nephew. Tears came into the eyes of the prophet and he said, I will speak to you as Joseph spoke unto his brethren. I will not reproach you today. Go, you are free. And now a scene was enacted, of which there is really no parallel in the history of the world. Hosts upon hosts came forward and adopted the religion of Islam. God Almighty testifies as to the lofty and exalted behavior of his messenger. Ye have indeed in the messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct. Holy Quran, Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 21. How well has Lamartine unknowingly echoed these sentiments? As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? 
In reply, we too can say once more, No, there is no man greater than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the greatest man that ever lived. So far, our hero has earned the unsolicited and ungrudging tributes from many non-Muslims of different religious persuasions and from varying intellectual fields of endeavor. But all this still remains incomplete without the Master's verdict, Muhammad's predecessor, Jesus Christ. We will now apply his own standard for evaluating greatness. John the Baptist John the Baptist, known throughout the Muslim world as Hazrat Yahya was a contemporary prophet of the Messiah. They were also cousins. Here is what the Master has to say of him. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Holy Bible, Matthew, chapter 11, verse 11. Every son of man is born of women. By this very fact, John the Baptist is greater than Moses, David, Solomon, Abraham, or Isaiah, none of the Israelite prophets excluded. What gives John this ascendancy over every other prophet? It could not be any miracle, because the Bible records none to his credit. It could not be his teachings, because he brought no new laws or regulations. Then what makes him the greatest? Simply because he was the heralder, a precursor, a harbinger of the happy news of the coming of the Messiah. This is what made John the greatest. But Jesus claims that he himself was even greater than the greatest. That is John. Why? But I have greater witness than that of John the Baptist, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish. Holy Bible, John, chapter 5, verse 36. It is the witness the commission which God Almighty had entrusted him with, which makes Jesus greater than even John. Applying these very standards as enunciated by the Master, we find that 1. John the Baptist was the greatest of all the Israelite prophets because he heralded the mighty Messiah, Jesus salam. Similarly, Jesus would be greater than even John because he heralded the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter, who was to guide mankind into all truth of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. 2. The diocese, the mission of Jesus peace be upon him, or the works which God had given him to accomplish, was limited to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew, chapter 15, verse 24. Whereas the mission of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was universal, he had been told, And we have sent thee not, O Muhammad, but as a mercy unto all the worlds. Holy Quran, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, Verse 107 In keeping with his grand commission, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam consistently delivered his message to one and all who would hear irrespective of race, class or creed. He welcomed them all in the religion of God, without any discrimination. He had no thought of dividing the creatures of God into dogs and pigs, Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 or into sheep and goats Matthew chapter 25 verse 32 He was the messenger of the one true God who was sent as a mercy unto all mankind nay unto the whole universe Holy Quran chapter 21 107 and he never forgot this mission even right up to his dying day towards the end of his earthly sojourn when he could look back to a hectic and dangerous past, now crowned with success. He now feels that he could sit back and enjoy the fruits of his toil. He dreams of a life free from turmoil and full of satisfaction and relaxation. Not for him. There is no time to rest or relax. There is work still to be done. God Almighty reminds him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةَ لِلنَّاسِ we have not sent thee, O Muhammad, but to the whole of mankind. Bashiram wa nazira, as a giver of glad tidings and as a warner. Walakinna aksarin nasila ya'lamun, but most of mankind still do not know. Holy Quran, Surah Sabah, Chapter 34, 
verse 28. How was he to respond to this new challenge in his ripening old age? There were no electronic gadgets of modern communication methods at his disposal. There were no telex and fax machines which he could exploit. What could he do? Being an umni, unlettered, he called the scribes and dictated five letters, one each to the emperor at Constantinople, the king of Egypt, the Negus of Abyssinia, the king of Yemen, and to the emperor in Persia. He called forth five Sahaba, his holy companions with five Arab steeds, and set them out in five different directions, inviting the nations of the world to the universal religion of God. I had the good fortune of seeing one of those holy epistles in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, Old Constantinople, Turkey. That letter is collecting dust. Materially, the Turks have preserved the parchment, but the message is collecting dust, as I have said. The letter begins, From Muhammad, the Messenger of God, to Heraclius, the Emperor at Constantinople. Accept Islam and be benefited. Followed by this exhortation from the Book of God. Qul ya ahl al-kitab Say, O people of the Book, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum Come to common terms as between us and you. Allah na'abuda illa Allah That we worship none but God. Wa la nushrika bihi shay'a That we associate no partners with Him. وَلَا يَتَّخِذَا بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ That we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than God. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُولُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّ مُسْلِمُونَ If then they turn back, say ye, bear witness, that we at least are Muslims bowing to God's will. Holy Quran Surah Ali Imran, Chapter 3, Verse 64 After the above Quranic insertion in the letter, it is concluded with felicitation in the Prophet's own words, ending with a seal on which is inscribed, There is no other object of worship but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. The letter in Turkey arouses our curiosity and interest with regards to its preservation but the preservation itself is lost upon the sightseer. The same Quranic message is in almost every Muslim home, being read and reread a thousand times over without the reader being moved to deliver its message to the addressees. Glance once more at the above verse. It is addressed to the Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, but for over a thousand years, we have utterly ignored the great directive at our own peril. We are sitting on that message like a cobra on a pile of wealth, keeping the rightful heirs at bay. This utter neglect will continue to inflict untold suffering to the Ummah for generations to come. After over 1400 years of our reading and chanting the Quran in every rhythmic style, we still hear this poignant cry. But most of mankind still do not know. Holy Quran, Surah Saba, Chapter 34, Verse 28 This is the concluding phrase of the verse revealed 1400 years ago. It was the factual situation of the then religious world. The question which must be asked is, is it any different today? Not at all. There are today more mushriks in the world than there are believers in the one true God. Is there any hope of changing this situation? Allah commanded his Prophet then as he is commanding us now through the first seven verses of Surah Mudassir, chapter 74. Ya ayyuhal muttathir, O thou wrapped up in a mantle. As usual, there is these wonderfully early mystical verses, including the ones that follow, a triple thread of thought. A. A particular occasion a person is referred to. B. A general spiritual lesson is taught and see a more profound mystical reverie is suggested. As to A, the Prophet was now past the stage of personal contemplation. Wearing his mantle, he was now to go forth and boldly deliver his message and publicly proclaim Allah, the one true God. His heart had always purified, 
but now all his outward doings must be dedicated to God, and conventional respect for ancestral customs or worship must be thrown aside. The work of his messengership was the most generous that could flow from his personality, but no reward or appreciation was to be expected from his people. But quite the contrary, there would be much call on his patience, but his contentment would arise from the good pleasure of God. As to be, similar stages arise in a minor degree in the life of every good man, for which the Prophet's life is to be a universal pattern. As to see, the Sufis understand by their mantle and outward wrappings the circumstances of our phenomenal existence, which are necessary to our physical comfort up to a certain stage, but we soon outgrow them, and our inner nature should then boldly proclaim itself not that it brings any credit or reward with men, the very hope of expectation of such would be inconsistent with our high nature, which should bear all checks and rejoice in the favours of God. Qum fa'anzir, arise and deliver thy warning, warabbaka fa'kabbir, and thy Lord do thou magnify, wathiyabaka fa'tukhir, and thy garments keep free from stain, what rujza fahjur, and all abomination shun. A. Rudz or rids means abomination and is usually understood to mean idolatry. It is even possible that there was an idol called rudz, but these days it has a wider significance as including a mental state opposed to true worship, a state of doubt or indecision. Walatamnun tastaksir nor expect in giving any increase for thyself. b. The legal and commercial formula is that you give in order to receive what is worth to you a little more than you can give, but expect nothing from the receiver. You serve God and God's creatures. But for thy Lord's cause, be patient and constant. c. Our zeal for God's cause itself requires that we should not be impatient and that we should show constancy in our efforts for his cause for we have faith and we know that he is all good all wise and all powerful and everything will ultimately be right abdullah yusuf ali holy quran surah mudathir chapter 74 verses 1 to 7 to the arabs in general and to our holy prophet in particular, a mantle was the protective covering used for protection against the sun, wind and sand. He was to say girding himself, rolling up his sleeves to accomplish his task, although most of the Muslims in the world do not cover themselves with shawls, in their day-to-day -day living they carry a host of mantles in the way of inferiority complexes. What can we do to make God's light shine forth through the darkness around us? We must first let it shine in our own true selves. With that light in the niche of our inmost hearts, we can walk with steps both firm and sure. We can humbly visit the comfortless and guide their steps. Not we, but the light will guide. But oh, the joy of being found worthy to bear the torch and to say to our brethren, I too was in darkness, comfortless, and behold, I have found comfort and joy in the grace divine. Thus should we pay the dues of brotherhood by walking humbly side by side in the ways of the Lord with mutual aid and comfort and heartfelt prayer backed by action that God's good purpose may be accomplished in us all together. Abdullah Yusuf Ali But most of mankind still do not know. Thus spake inspired our holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on whom we invoke god's blessing forever and ever amen end of chapter 3 end of part 3